I have seen something so amazing. In fact, it's so amazing sometimes it disgusts me. You ever get disgusted by something amazing? It's amazing in a good way, but it's, it can also be annoying. It's like people who get up in a good mood, you know. They're so annoying. You know, the, the Proverbs even talks about that. Have you read that proverb? I can't remember where it is, but it talks about how annoying it is to be with a person who greets you effusively in the morning. <laughs> Anyway, this is an annoying thing that's also amazing and wonderful, and that is mothers who love wayward children. Do you know what I mean? I have seen mothers, literally I wanted to say, mom, you know, some tough love might work better here, you know? Kick the bum out! You know? But I've seen mothers just put up and put up and put up with some amazingly disgusting behavior. And see, I've seen fathers, now fathers, we're going to have Father's Day pretty soon, but you notice Father's Day is a real dud compared to Mother's Day. You've noticed that, haven't you? Yeah. It's not because fathers are losers or fathers aren't important, but frankly, fathers aren't revered as much as mothers. Why is that? Because fathers are tougher. There may be some other reasons, too. But one of the reasons is because fathers are tougher. You know, fathers, they'll just call you by the, you know, you're a disgrace to the family. You know, you've heard that. Why, no son of mine. And a mother will say, now, dear, now, dear. Remember, this is our child. We raised him. The apple doesn't fall far from the tree. So uh, mothers have a tremendously godly trait in that they will disassociate. Are you with me? They'll disassociate the sin from the sinner. They'll say... But this is my child. I love this child. You know, dad will say, our daughter is a... Yeah, it might only take four words, four letters. And mother will say, no! This is our precious daughter. She's in trouble. Do you hear that difference? Now, fathers can be just as loving and kind, too. Isn't that true, dads? You've put up with a lot, haven't you? I know. And you've been just as... But, but, but mothers just kind of have a reputation for that. That they can disassociate the sinners from the sinner. So they can go on just, this is my precious darling. I mean, you see these mothers right there, you know, at, 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 when, the, when the, the boy is, is about to experience capital punishment. You know, and he's obviously guilty. And, and, and she's still crying and saying, my baby. You know, where everybody else says, you know, good riddance. Get the rat off the planet. Now, I, I, I'm calling your attention to this because in this way, I, I see God as being kind of, kind of mothering. Because he also has the ability to disassociate the sin from the sinner. Isn't that a wonderful thing? And to look at the sinner, even the most terrible sinner, in a, 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 with a loving attitude, with a, with, a, with a forgiving, accepting attitude. It's just astonishing. This is what we read about our, our, our dear God. The Father judges no one, okay, now, we often think of the Father as the judge. I think I've even seen Christian artwork painted where, you know, there's the judgment hall and the Father's up there. And uh, then there's Jesus, you know, trying to help us out a little bit. And the angels, but the law is, is there and, and all of our sins are there in the books. And, and the Bible says the Father judges no one. Have we got that clear? Because I heard someone in a testimony just this week say that the, the heavenly Father was becoming more precious to them. 
That they had always thought Jesus loved them, but now the Heavenly Father Himself was becoming precious. They were realizing that His love was just as much as Jesus. The Father judges no one. Now that's an interesting statement. Can we take that right on the surface of it? The Father judges no one? What about the great judgment? What about the throne high and lifted up? What about all humanity coming before Him? What about we must be judged for every word we speak, every thought, every... Father judges no one. So if, something, if someone is judging us, it isn't the Father. Don't you feel better already? See, dads, we don't have to be like that. We can still be good fathers and not be like that. You can say, wait a minute, somebody has to be the stern. Somebody has to do some judging around here. I didn't say we don't have to do any judging. I said we don't have to judge people. What? Folks, there's so much confusion on this subject. I hope I can throw a little light on it. If I don't, I'll preach another sermon on it. You let me make sure I clear it up. This is such a great subject. The Father judges no one. He's not in judgment mode. You say, well, what about the lightning? What about Sodom and Gomorrah? What about, what about the, the hell? <laughs> Who's in charge of that? No, there is a destruction of the wicked at the end, but the Father judges no one. This is stands. This is statement is true. This is Scripture. The Father judges no one. All right? So, where does judgment come from then? I guess it must come from Jesus, huh? It says right here, He has given all judgment to the Son. So then Jesus is the judge. Wow. I, don't, that, I suppose that would be more reasonable. Jesus is a man, at least, so he would understand, you know, human issues. He would make, perhaps, a more worthy judge. Also, Jesus um, uh, has died for us, so we would anticipate that he would at least be a, a generous judge. But, but uh, here we read that he's given all judgment to the Son. The Father's like, I don't want to be the judge. You be the judge. I love that about God. He doesn't even want to be in charge. He doesn't want to be the boss. Uh, he, he has to be the boss because he made everything, but he's the only one who can keep everything going. But, but seriously, he's not interested in bossing. And he's not interested in judging either. I don't want to be the judge. You, you, you do the judging, he says to Jesus. Well, what, what about Jesus? Does Jesus want to be the judge? Here's what Jesus says. He says, if anyone listens to my sayings and doesn't believe, I don't judge him. For I came not to judge, but to save. Well, my, my, my. The Father's not judging. Jesus doesn't want to judge either. No wonder the world's been here such a long time. They can't get the judgment going. <laughs> Nobody wants to do it. They should hire some of you. Some of you would be glad to. Now, seriously, since I don't know your personalities that well yet, you know I'm just guessing. <laughs> just, just going on history from some Adventist churches I've been in over the years, my suspicion is there may be a few here who would be willing to volunteer. Okay, I'll do it. Let me judge. <laughs> well, obviously, Jesus doesn't consider himself a judge. He says, I came to save. I came to save. My business is the business of saving. I'm not in the business of condemning. By the way, the word condemn and judge are the same in the New Testament Greek. What did I just say? The words condemn and judge, condemnation and judgment are the same in the Greek language. All right, so Jesus says, I didn't come to judge. I didn't come to condemn. I came to save. Mothers don't condemn their children. Some of them don't. Jesus doesn't condemn people. Remember when Jesus met the lady who was uh, a test case for him? And they were trying to see if he would, in fact, support the Mosaic Code. Now, the Mosaic Code said that if anyone was actually caught in adultery and there was you know, sufficient evidence to prove it, that that person should be stoned. And no time should be wasted that person should be taken out of the camp and stoned to death. To our modern culture, that seems awfully severe. But God was making a point in all these death penalties. Have you noticed how many death penalties there are in the Old Testament? Anybody noticed? Most of the sins in the Old Testament have a death penalty attached to them. 
So what's that about? Well, it's about God showing us that sin kills. Doesn't it? I, I read the Old Testament. I can't see that they ever enforce those death penalties. You don't read about any mass, you know, stonings. Or, there was a little bit of time when they were out in the wilderness, you know, in the, in the, in, uh, the, in the 40 years that uh, they were under Moses' leadership and they kept uh, those regulations pretty seriously. But I can't see it later on through Israel's, Israel's history. And they brought Jesus, this lady, who under Moses' code should be condemned and should be stoned. They had enough evidence. Now, we know they set her up, and we know that they only brought the woman and not the guy, you know, which was extremely hypocritical of them. But nevertheless, she was guilty and made no pretense to the contrary. She was guilty. So when they brought her before Jesus, and Jesus scared away all her accusers, you remember how he did that, don't you? Yeah. By the way, he didn't condemn them either. No, he didn't. He did not condemn them. Uh, he just started writing uh, on the pavement there in the dust. He started writing a list of sins. And as each man came forward and recognized his sins and went away embarrassed, then Jesus would just erase it. Now, Jesus wasn't condemning those men. He was just acknowledging their sins. In fact, he did it in the most careful way he could so that no one else could see the sins, but only the person who was guilty. Isn't that amazing? So even in helping out this poor condemned woman, he didn't condemn her accusers. If anybody could, he could. All judgment is given to whom? To the son, that's right. So when he scared away all of her accusers, he looks up and uh, she looks up and he says, Has no man condemned thee? And she said, No man, Lord. She must have been shocked. She was expecting to be publicly ridiculed at the very least, probably not stoned because the Jews didn't have the power to kill, although they did it sometimes. But under the Roman authority, the Jews weren't supposed to kill people without a, without a Roman uh, approval. But she was in big trouble, and she knew it. And she looks around and she says, No one's condemning me, Lord. And Jesus said to her, Neither do I condemn you. Now, was Jesus uh, overlooking her sins? Was he ignoring them? Does a doctor ignore a disease? Better not. No, but he was not condemning. See, this is the difference. He's able to isolate the sin from the sinner. He's able to say, I don't condemn you. Now, don't keep doing that. Isn't that beautiful? I'm going to tell you something, folks. I believe that our ability to change is greatly enhanced by not being condemned. Some people will say they'll never be different unless you condemn them. That's not true. Jesus came to save the world. When they realize that they are not condemned. Now, I'm not saying the sin is not condemned. But when they realize they are not condemned, they can then have some personal hope that they can be a new person through Christ. She realized she was not condemned. I am certain Jesus smiled at her. I am certain that Jesus made it clear through his facial expression to her that day that he regarded her with as much respect and appreciation as any other human being. I am sure that she felt God's desire for her through Jesus Christ. There wasn't even a kind of odious at a distance kind of a, well, I'm not going to condemn you. Jesus clearly was her friend that day. I don't condemn you. This verse is absolutely astonishing. Just a little bit later in the same chapter, John the 8th chapter, Jesus says, you judge according to the flesh, and you expect the end of that statement to be, but I judge according to the Spirit. Or you judge by the outward, but I judge the heart. You know, like it says in the Old Testament. But Jesus changes it. 
in the New Testament. And he says, you judge according to the flesh, and I don't judge. Wow. So if the Father's not judging, and Jesus isn't judging, who's judging? Tragically, the church Some of the church members. I talked to a Catholic lady the other day. She just had said, you know, I'm sorry, I let you down. And then she said, I'm sorry about everything. I'm Catholic. <laughs> she says, I was raised to be sorry. But, I mean, it's true because, you know, in Catholicism, you're under condemnation, condemnation, condemnation. And uh, it's not true. In Christ, it's not true. Now, you may be under some condemnation. You very well may be. If the Father's not condemning you or judging you. Jesus is not condemning or judging you. But there is something that judges you. What is that? The law. Yeah. The law... Is condemning us. But not Jesus. The law. Well, isn't that the same? No. It's not the same. It's not the same. It makes a huge difference. Here's what Jesus experienced. Our chief priests and our rulers handed him over to be condemned to death. And crucified him. So who has been condemned? Jesus has been condemned. Jesus has been judged. Imagine this dialogue. Father and son are talking to each other shortly after Adam and Eve eat the forbidden fruit. Jesus... Jesus says, Father, what do you think we should do? The Father says, well, we talked about this a long time back, but let's review our conversation. We agreed to make them free will creatures. We agreed that we couldn't really enjoy their love unless it was voluntary. And it wouldn't be voluntary unless they were free will creatures. And we knew that if we made them free will creatures, they would have to have real freedom. And that would include the possibility of violating the laws that run the universe. We knew that. And Jesus says, yes, Father, I am glad you remember that. That's the way I remember it, too. We took the chance and created the circumstances which allowed this to happen. I personally formed them. I personally breathed into them my life, Jesus says. I personally gave them the godlike trait of self determination. I gave them curiosity. I gave them an opportunity to choose wrong. I allowed Satan to come into the garden and tempt them. And so, Father, in light of all of that, I don't see how we can condemn them for making the free choice that we said they could make. And the Father says, I totally agree. And Jesus says, so, the death penalty is clear. The law condemns them, but we don't. So what shall we do? course they've already made their decision haven't they Jesus says put all the blame on me 
every bit of it. Put it all on me. Every wrong thought, every wrong word, every wrong feeling, every wrong choice, every wrong action, every wrong decision, every hurtful, selfish, every thoughtless, every pain-producing, every destructive, put it all on me. I gave them the opportunity to make that terrible choice, and so it is legal, it is lawful, it is just that I can take the blame for it all. If we confess our sins, He's faithful and just to forgive us because He can take the blame. The Maker can take the blame for the product defect. The maker, maker can take the blame. That is why, my friend, you never need to beg Jesus to forgive you. Because he already has taken the blame for it all. Every particle of it. He's already taken the blame. He was condemned. Now, wouldn't it be defeating for him to condemn us then? Why would he condemn us? The whole business of him dying on the cross and coming and taking the blame for our sins was so he wouldn't have to condemn us. So he doesn't. All the condemnation has gone on him. All the blame has gone on him. But he was innocent. Yes, but he took the guilt. He became sin for us who knew no sin. It says in Romans 5, So then as through one trespass, that was Adam and Eve's sin, all men were condemned, even so through one act of righteousness, this is Jesus' death on the cross, all men are justified to life. Everyone. That doesn't mean everyone's going to get eternal life, but everyone could. It's such a waste for anyone to die because Jesus has taken the blame for every sin. How many? Everyone. It's not astonishing, really. It's just astonishing. How many times have you sinned this morning? Don't go light on yourself now. How many times have you misrepresented the Lord this morning? <laughs> How many times have you doubted this morning? How many times have you been selfish this morning? Jesus took the blame for it all. You want to say hallelujah for that? Don't you want to? Let's just say it together. Hallelujah. All of it. Man, that's great. It just makes confessing such a privilege, such a glorious thing. Say, Lord, I know you're not, you're not needing for me to grovel. You're not needing for me to flagellate myself. You're not needing for me to, 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 to punish myself in some way. You've already taken all the blame. Thank you, Jesus. There is therefore now no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus, who walk not after the flesh but after the Spirit. Because they have already accepted Jesus' condemnation in their behalf. Now, somebody's going to say, wait a minute, wait a minute. I have a condemning voice inside of me. I have a voice inside of me that says, shame on you. You could be psychotic. <laughs> you know, people do hear voices. I'm going to tell you the truth. Actually, there are voices, and there are, in fact, two of them. And, and until I learned this, I used to be depressed most of the time. The Spirit's voice, Jesus says in John 16, will convict the world about sin and about righteousness and about judgment. Ah, there it is. I knew it. We're being condemned. There's a little voice in there saying, what a rat you are. What a monster. What a rotten person you are. No, 
That voice is Satan. Do you think the Holy Spirit would condemn people that Jesus wouldn't condemn? Of course not. The Holy Spirit convicts people. Can you remember those two C's? What's the first one? Condemn. What's the second one? Convict. Can we try that again? Condemn. Convict. Condemn. Oh, we better change sides. Huh? Let me give equal charge. Condemn. Convict. Do you know the difference between those words? We are just born condemners. We know what can... Conviction is something quite different. Conviction is like the doctor says, you know, I've discovered, you know, after all the tests and reading your tests, that, that you have a, a growth, you know, on your spinal column. Now, that's a conviction. It's, it's, a, it's a diagnosis. It's a... It's a informational issue. You have a disease. You have a sin. Condemnation is you are a leper. You see the difference? We are born condemners. We are just born contemporary. But the Holy Spirit is not in it. Because the Holy Spirit says, you are a child of God. I love you. I have designed you to be a prince or a princess forever. You are absolutely fabulous to me. I can see everything about you that, that, that can live forever. And, and I, I am ready to heal you. And you have some issues, but we can take care of those. And the devil says, you are a loser. You are evil. You are... Wicked, you are wrong, you are despicable, you are hopeless, you are disgusting, you are a hypocrite, you shouldn't even bother going to church because it doesn't change you, you are a rat through and through, you've known it since you were a child, you've tried and tried to change, you can't change, you're disgusting, give up. Sounds just like my sister when I was growing up. Children automatically know that devil's language. Or maybe the devil just uses children. I don't know. There's even a song that goes with it. Remember that little song? I've heard this song in Russia. I've heard this song in Africa. All children know it automatically from birth. It has different words, of course, according to the language, but it always has the same tune. Always the same tune. The tune is this. Na, 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 na. Na, 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 na. Where, where is it? You know what that tune, you know, you know the words of that tune is, don't you? Bobby is a loser. Tommy is a thief. See, God never says Tommy is a thief. Tom, God says, Tommy has broken the law and has stolen something. You see the difference? That's conviction. Satan says, Tommy's a thief. He is a through and through thief. That's what he is. That's his core self. He is a thief. Come on, you've all heard it. What's your self-talk about? Half the time your self-talk is just echoing Satan's talk to you. Oh, I'm awful. Oh, I'm such a creep. Man, am I disgusting. What an evil person I am. I'm so selfish. Wait, 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 wait. That doesn't honor God. I am a child of God. I am a noble creature made in the image of God. I have been contaminated with sins which I want to have separated from myself as rapidly as possible. You read Romans 7 and tell me if I'm not right theologically. It's not I who sin, but it's the sin that lives within me. Yes, you can choose to identify with your sins. You can choose to say, that's the real me. Yes, that's the real me. And you can choose to go to hell with it too. But you don't have to. You can choose to let Jesus take the blame for all of it. Amen? You can choose to accept the conviction of the Holy Spirit, which convicts us of sin 
And then if you read the next verse, because of unbelief. In other words, the Holy Spirit never stops by saying, you're a sinner. He st goes on and says, you haven't had enough faith. Let me diagnose your problem. Let me show you how to have an answer to it. And then he convicts us of righteousness because Jesus is in heaven already being our advocate and dispensing his righteousness upon us anytime we want it. And he convicts us of judgment, not because we're being judged. Read that next verse, verse 9, when you get a chance. Not because we're being judged, but because Satan is being judged. Satan is condemned. Not you. And the Holy Spirit wants to give you encouragement. See, salvation never works by discouragement. If you have a theology that discourages you, like I used to have a lady who sat in the second row of church every week. She sat in the second row. Really worried me. She'd come out after church some days. She said, Pastor, that was a great sermon. I really felt spanked. <laughs> Boy, that wasn't what I had intended. <laughs> she said another time, I never feel like I've really been to church unless I've really been hit between the eyes. Man. See, that's not the point of it at all. The point is to encourage people. God is an encourager. The Holy Spirit is an encourager. His name is Comforter. The voice that says to you, you are so disgusting, that is Satan. That's the condemning voice. The voice that says to you, you're a child of God, I can save you from this, that's the Holy Spirit. Would you differentiate between those two, please? Because a lot of you are giving the Holy Spirit credit for what Satan is saying to you. And it really discourages you. And you think, oh, God is so angry with me. He's so mad at me. God is, God is against me. God is against me now because I'm so wicked. My friend, God is not against you. God is on your side. God is against your sins, yes. He's going to do what he can to separate you from those sins, but he's not against you. You are his precious. He who says evil against his brother or makes himself his brother's judge says evil against the law and is judging the law. It's not a weird thing. I knew a lady who said, but somebody has to really point out sin. I think that's my job. She was very serious about this. Now, she was a lady who came from an ethnicity a little different than some of yours. But she, uh, in this particular ethnicity, they took this kind of thing even more seriously than most Americans do. But I've seen Americans do it too. But um, she, uh, she encouraged her son to marry a beautiful young lady. In fact, I performed the wedding. And they were a handsome couple. He was, uh, was uh, tall and, uh, and dark hair and broad shouldered and very uh, noble features and, and almost like royalty. And, and she was just as, just as much like a princess. And oh man, what a couple they made. And, and, and in their wedding, they were just gorgeous. Well, it wasn't just a few weeks later than, than the mother is saying, I made a mistake. I should have never encouraged this marriage. This girl's not good enough for you. He, his mother finally talked him into divorcing her. Because once, you know, they were relatives and close, and in some of these ethnicities, the relatives get a lot closer, as you know. She could see the shortcomings. She wasn't as good of a housekeeper. She wasn't as good of a cook. You know, she didn't like the way she was taking care of the baby. She didn't like the way she was taking care of her boy. Should have never encouraged this. Encouraged him to get a divorce. That poor young man... His life was wrecked. His mother may have had good intentions, but by her condemning ways, she ruined a marriage. She ruined two lives. She ruined her grandson. She ruined everything. When she could have taken that girl under her wing and said, I love you, and nurtured her right into being a perfect wife. You know why you judge the law when you judge somebody else? Because the law says, love your neighbor as yourself. And when you judge others, you are saying God's law is wrong. Do not love your neighbor as yourself. Condemn your neighbor. 
In fact, most condemnation is really done as a stupid method of perking yourself up, which never works, by the way. You'll just get more depressed. Therefore, be merciful, even as your Father is also merciful. Don't judge, and you won't be judged. Don't condemn, and you won't be condemned. Well, I like that. How many times I've been just on the verge? Have you ever been there? I've been just on the verge, you know. I've already written the letter over five times. I've got it down, you know. And I'm just on the verge of delivering this scathing rebuke when I hear the Holy Spirit saying, Would you like for me to talk to you that way? <laughs> Maybe not. Is there still time for me to repent? Don't condemn, and you won't be condemned. Then let us not be judges of one another any longer. Amen? Amen. Let's pull together, shall we? This church cannot just be the best church in the city. It can be the best church in the state. It can be the best church in the country if we will Seek Jesus. If we'll let, if the Holy Spirit speak to us and we'll cast out that other voice and we'll accept the fact that we're not condemned, that we're forgiven and we'll let him heal us and we'll stop condemning each other and we'll love each other. Folks, the community out there is just longing for an environment of healing. And this can be it. Father in heaven, we commit ourselves to living in a non-condemning way and to availing ourselves every moment of your forgiveness and cleansing. Through Jesus Christ we pray. Amen.